Okay, our first speaker is Mark Graham from the Natural History Museum, London, United Kingdom, on the conservation and mounting of a large skull of the ichthyosaur Temnodontosaurus paleodon from the Jurassic coast of England. Well, good morning, everybody. I'm not sure whether 8.20 on a Sunday morning following an evening's entertainment on karaoke is the best place to be. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't singing, so my voice shouldn't be too badly affected. Um, I'm really pleased to be here with you today. And uh, I thought I'd take you through um, a project that I've recently completed at the museum. Uh, and unusually, this was a commercial project for the Natural History Museum. We don't get very many of these, but um, Lyme Regis Museum asked us to take a look at this particular specimen I'm going to show you. And uh, we carried out some rather interesting work on it, which I thought you might appreciate seeing. I was also trying to <coughs> find a specimen that was large enough to impress my colleagues here at the Royal Tyrrell, because obviously the stuff that they've got... <laughs> It's not going to be any good bringing along the small stuff I work with, so uh, hopefully this will impress you to some extent. Um, just to set the scene, the historical context, because there is some for this specimen, which is a nice angle to it, really. Um, those of you that have been to the NHM in London might recognize that. Um, that's uh, a specimen of Temnodontosaurus, which was the first one ever collected from the um, Lias of Dorset. And that was collected by uh, the brother of uh, Mary Anning. Uh, he found the skull, and then she subsequently went on to find the neck, so that we've got this wonderful, iconic specimen in the uh, exhibitions. Lyme Regis Museum have had a cast of that for some years, and uh, to mark the 200 years of its um, discovery, we actually took that skull back to Lyme Regis Museum, and they had it on display for a few months. And coincidentally, the skull that I'm about to show you then became available to them, so it's a nice kind of twist in the tail of this story. Um, so it was named Temnodontosaurus platydon by Coney Bear, and it's uh, on display currently in our museum. That's the, um, that's the lower lias of the Jurassic Coast in England. I took a series of photos and just cropped them together there, and the specimen I'm going to be talking to you about came from the second nodule bed, which is around about here, and it's called the Birchie bed. Just down here, for those of you that might be interested, is the Charmouth Centre, where they have yet another example of, um, of this particular specimen on display. There we go. So the background to this project. There was a landslide in 2008, and uh, it was quite a significant landslide. And all of the local collectors descended upon the place, as they always do, hoping to find something significant. And uh, sure enough, another specimen of Temnodontosaurus did, did become available. Um, a local collector called Mike Harrison uh, managed to find seven blocks containing a one and a half long metre skull. And it was quite a job because apart from anything else, he had to try and keep it quiet because everybody around there is very, very keen to get in and get their you know, fair share of whatever comes to light. So Mike had a bit of a job on his hands really and over a period of months he actually managed to recover these seven very large blocks most of it in his own time and uh, under his own sort of steam. And uh, he did the right thing. He registered the find under the area's fossil collecting code of conduct. It's rather different to what you've got in this area. Along the Dorset coast, if you find anything on the beach, you're, you're able to keep it. Uh, you're not allowed to dig into the cliffs to recover anything, though. But this, because it was part of a landslide, was, was fair game. It's actually sitting on the surface. So um, he registered the, the find. Um, and subsequently he, he got it prepared by one of the local specialists. In this area of the UK, a lot of people have relocated to live down there because they're so keen uh, you know, on fossil collection and paleontology generally, and there are probably three or four really good preparators down there, and he gave it to one of the guys to actually prepare the specimen for him. And uh, he did a good job of the preparation, actually, and subsequently Mike Harrison decided to offer uh, the specimen for sale to Lyme Regis Museum. And in order to do that, he had to go through the offices of an outfit called the, um, the Dorset Museum's Advisory Service. And they, in turn, contacted the Natural History Museum, and they asked me to go down and assess the condition of the skull and to say whether or not they felt that it would be a good purchase in terms of its um, condition. So I actually did that, and I was able to do a very positive report for them. So much so that they said, well, you know, if we are successful, would you undertake this work for us? If there's any work to be done in terms of additional preparation and conservation, would you do it? 
and would the museum be able to actually create a mount for it? Because it's a very difficult specimen to mount, as you'll see in a moment. So they did that. They put in for what's called a prison bid, which is a, a government-funded scientific fund. They were successful in that. They got the money. They raised some funds locally as well, and they were able to buy the specimen from the collector. And the deadline was to have it ready for Easter of this year, which we managed to achieve. And I think the, uh, the specimen came to the museum in November. The only slight complication from the engineering point of view, because our engineering department were involved in this, is that it coincided with a lot of exhibitions that we had coming up at the museum already. We had one on extinctions, and we had a couple of other projects that were underway, so it, it did create some problems for the people who were making the frame for this thing, which uh, I'll talk to you about in a minute. But from the conservation point of view, the, the blocks were significantly cracked throughout, really. Um, but it was caused through shrinkage, and typically that birchite bed that I showed you on the first slides, the stuff that comes out of there can be pyritic, um, and there is an awful lot of cracking. Uh, these blocks, fortunately, were cracked, but not through pyrite decay, and we were able to determine that because the cracks were very, very clean. And usually, when, as you know, when it's pyrite um, deterioration, the edges of cracks become very sort of jagged. There was no evidence of that. There was no smell of, of pyrite decay, particularly around most of the specimen. So we were pretty confident that it was in good condition generally. But there was a problem that you'll see in a moment, in that the tooth rows had been acid prepped. And during the course of that, I think they'd gone just overboard with the acid. And it started to affect some of the matrix and the teeth themselves that had become quite friable and uh, looked very, very vulnerable to me. There was also a very slight smell of sulfur which is indicative of you know, the, the commencement of pyrite decay, potentially. So there's some concerns about that part of the specimen. Well, the blocks were, were pretty, pretty heavy, actually. There were seven of them, including the two blocks that contained the rostrum. Um, and because all of the palate bones and the jaw bones were also intact, the blocks were all of different depths. So to actually get the thing aligned in the first place was quite a task in itself, um, which it was fun to overcome. So the, the, the initial approach was to, to gap fill the, uh, the gaps, the smaller gaps, and we used B72 for that, uh, as usual, and glass, glass micro balloons in the uh, reasonable sized cracks, but some of the cracks were no thicker than the size of your thumb now, the width of your thumb now, and in those we used Japanese paper soaked in B72, and that was really quite effective. It enabled us to stabilize a lot of those surfaces. Along the tooth rows, where we were concerned about the potential for pyrite decay to set in, uh, I decided to treat it with um, ethanolamine thioglycolo paste. Um, and what we did there was to make up a paste using um, sepia light, go along the tooth, and actually um, stabilize any potential um, pyrite oxidation that was coming through. And I'll show you some pictures of that in a moment. So here are some shots of, of the beast. Uh, that up there, obviously, is the sclerotic rings around one of the, uh, one of the orbits. You can't quite see there, but that's absolutely full of cracks across that block. Uh, here's another shot of one of the uh, eye rings there. And you can see these major cracks, obviously, are the cracks between the blocks. So there's no way that we could actually adhere these blocks together. They were going to have to be supported in a jacket that held them in place. There's no way that they could actually be stuck together, as it were. And these are pictures of the tooth rows. And you can see there where the acid work has left those looking quite vulnerable in places. It's a shame, really, because the tooth rows are beautiful. There's some really, really nicely conserved teeth in there. So that was the mixture of the chemicals that we use. It's 5% ethanolamine thioglycolate and 95 um, industrial methylated spirits mixed with sepia light to form a paste. The paste was spread along the tooth rows and then put cling film across them and we left them for two hours to, um, to stabilize the teeth. I then brushed them off using just a, a standard brush and then went across the tooth with uh, a light air abrasion with sodium bicarbonate. And that came up really well. We got a lot of detail out of the teeth. The teeth cleaned up beautifully and all of the loose materials actually came away. What you sometimes do get is a slight discoloration when you use ethylene. You get uh, a slight mauve coloration. Uh, in this case, it wasn't too bad, actually, and it came off quite easily with a little bit of um, methylated spirit. So that was the complete skull, the seven blocks there making it up. 
And the real problem for us was around this area here, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, this was the left lower jaw, the mandible, and unfortunately, because this area was so badly compressed during fossilization, there was no way of aligning that without lifting the whole of the skull over this way. So the orientation was very, very difficult. And of course, when you did that, these blocks that were quite heavy in the middle just didn't want to stay in place, so the whole thing was shifting. So actually orientating it became quite an issue for us, as you'll see. That was probably the fourth attempt <laughs> at doing it wrongly. So what I was trying to do there was to use wooden blocks to get the, get the skull in the right orientation. And it, it just kept moving. They were so heavy with the blocks, and there were sandbags under there as well, that it just kept slipping out of position. The collector had, had this on his kitchen table, and then he took it into his living room, and all of his fossils, including this one in the centerpiece, actually took up the whole of his living room table, which is probably why he sold it, because there was just no way to eat a meal in this guy's house. This thing was stuck on his table. And uh, he'd got it on wooden blocks, and I thought, well, if he'd managed to get it orientated, I'll try it. But of course, what I hadn't realized was that he hadn't been able to orientate this lower jaw at all. So that piece was completely um, uh, not, not visible when I went around to his home to assess the condition of the thing. These blocks were really heavy, and they were sitting on, on top of the, um, the sclerotic rings here. I was really concerned not to damage these areas because the preservation was beautiful. So, after several attempts, we did manage to do it, and amazingly, the best material to use were the, uh, the foam boards, really. We just used the foam boards, we put a few sandbags underneath the skull to give it some further stability, and uh, actually managed to get the thing in the right uh, orientation. You can see there the extent to which it had become distorted during fossilization. The whole of that left side had gone flattened and been lifted. In a way, that offered an opportunity for us, because we felt that if we could create the mount in such a way that you accentuated that, it'd be a really, really powerful display piece. And that's what it turned out to be, as you'll see in a moment. So the support of the, of the actual cradle was uh, a little bit challenging. I started off by filling all of the undercuts with uh, oil-free plastazine. I was really concerned about undercuts because there, there were so many potential areas where this could have gone wrong across the surface of this skull. Obviously, we filled in the areas where the teeth were uh, with foam, taped them all across, covered the thing in uh, cellophane foil. Then we covered it in uh, aluminium foil, taped it down and patted down to get as, as good a surface as we possibly could, as true a surface as we could. And then the first um, part of the jacket I decided to make um, using resin and fiberglass rather than this green stuff which is for the outer layer. Uh, which is called EPAPAST, which is a two-part epoxy paste that we use uh, very, um, very widely in the museum. The reason I did that was uh, I, I knew that uh, the resin and fiberglass would be pliable, so that if there was an undercut that I'd missed, I'd be able to get it off without damaging the bones. If you allow this stuff to go hard uh, directly, or obviously there's a barrier, but directly onto the bone, and you've got an undercut, you've got a real problem, because although this is very, very light and very, very strong, it's completely inflexible. So you, have to, you end up cutting it to get, the, uh, to get the thing off of this specimen, if you found an undercut. So once, once, this, was, uh, once this had dried off, uh, I put a layer of the EPAPAS paste on top of that and allowed it to harden. Obviously, I'd lifted that and realized that it was going to come off nicely. That was the whole point. I then got our carpentry department to build this for me, to form the support so that we could flip the skull over onto its um, underside. And that's the underside of the skull. And uh, that's the pallet, obviously. And you can see there the blocks were pretty hefty. The whole thing weighed about 160 pounds. And this was the, uh, the troublesome part down here. What was nice about it, there was good possibilities for research because the brain case was completely intact. Originally, we were hoping to make the support so that some of this would be visible. But the more we thought about it, the more we realized that it just wasn't going to be possible to do that. It just weighed too much and it was too unstable because the blocks were of different sizes and different weights. So what we decided to do was to repeat the process basically again, so infilling and then creating initially a resin and fiberglass um, layer. That's the layer that uh, held all of the contours. So what I wanted to do was to make sure that this particular piece here was as well contoured as it could possibly be so that it would hold the skull into the best possible orientation. Again, once that came out safely and without any undercuts, 
I repeated the process with EPAPAST and created this. And then we went about setting into here a metal support frame to give it some real strength. And this is how we, this is the stage before the steel frame was made. So having now created the, um, the seat or the, the structure that's going to hold the, the specimen, we went back to Lyme Regis and said, you've got a choice about how you display this now. We recommended this to give it the best possible display to make it really a powerful display piece. They agreed with that. In order to do that, we started creating this steel structure. Built it up with that initially, so it looked like a, a tricycle. <laughs> Brought it back into the prep lab and then went over many of these areas with EPAPAST again, so there's absolutely no way that that was ever going to shift. And in actual fact, the skull, when we put them back into this area, sat beautifully. You could almost have got away with it without a steel frame. It was going on public display, so we wanted to be absolutely sure it was completely safe. So this was what we ended up with. This was a skull in the engineering lab once we put the blocks back into place and it's seated nicely. And then at the bottom here, you can see what it looks like when the skull pieces came off and the steel supports were in place. And this was all of the structure that we had to build just to accommodate that troublesome jaw that was going down there. It really was so difficult to keep that piece in place. But eventually, there it was. It actually worked. Looks really good. The flattened area, which was such a problem to start with, was displayed to really good effect. I think it's a really dynamic display angle. And that is now the centerpiece of Lyme Regis's new display at the museum. And there it is, packed off and ready to go back to them. I was quite sorry to see the back of it because I'd had it for two or three months. they become quite a fond friend. We do get sort of close to these things, don't we? That was it. Thank you very much indeed.